The agenda is set. I'm Brent Goff in Berlin. It's time to talk. Ukraine's faces of political contempt. Can they turn protest back into peace? Corruption at the top. China's rotten elite and their Western enablers. And the children, our schools are failing. Poor marks for education where it counts most. Welcome to the show, everyone. I've invited three people today to talk, ponder, and pry apart these headlines. Now, how do you solve the equation? Good schools plus healthy students equals a great education. Well, you can't if you don't do your homework. Marion Leeser has done her homework. She's an education, education advocate with the NGO Oxfam. Marion, it's good to have you on the show Thank today. You. Corruption in China. It starts and stops at the top. That's what Beijing likes to believe. That's according to Gudrun Wacker. She is an authority on China with the SWP think tank here in Berlin. Gudrun, it's good to have you on the show with us. And there's a little bit of deja vu for my next guest. She joined me here a couple of months ago to talk about the crisis in her home country, Ukraine. I'm happy to welcome again Irina Solonenko, she was part of the Orange Revolution about 10 years ago. Irina, here you are today, an emergency session of parliament, the prime minister resigning. Is the beginning of peace now finally coming? It's difficult to say so because uh, after the re resignation of prime minister, the president still has to accept the resignation. And afterwards, it takes two months until the new cabinet can be formed. So it might be um, a sign of concession, but we, we shouldn't relax, I think, until we know whether the opposition gains the, the, the cabinet or not. A sign of concession? What about a, a sacrificial lamb, right? The president, he's not going anywhere, right? He's not going anywhere, right, and he might be willing, he still has forces to continue, he might be willing still to fight, not to really step back. Um, I mean, it's good to have the government he controls. According to the current constitution, the president has a lot of powers, not the parliament, and he has full control over the government and uh, over repression, repressive institutions. Uh, a lot of people are now in detention, those who protested. Mm -hmm. um, but he, he has said that um, he would be willing to get rid of the laws, for example, against demonstrating. I mean, it, it sounds like the, the, the president is making a lot of concessions. But Let, you're not so convinced, are you? Let's see uh, what the outcome of today's session is. So it's very important, of course, to uh, reveal, uh, re, re, um, to cancel those laws. Yes, that's true. And also maybe to adopt some law or decision on uh, freeing those opposition uh, um, protesters who are now in detention. Okay. Well, you know, when Arena was here back in December, the question was, is Ukraine being pulled apart in a tug of war between Russia and Europe? Well, it's become a battle now from within opposition groups demanding that President Yanukovych resign and saying that he's an enemy of his own people. Well, now you have parliament entering in an emergency session. So the question now is, can politicians negotiate a peace before it's lost completely on the streets? President Viktor Yanukovych offered a power sharing deal to senior figures in the Ukrainian opposition. Yanukovych offered the Prime Minister's post to Arseniy Yasenyuk of the Fatherland Party. The opposition leaders turned down the overture. Acceptance would not have gone down well with their following. Protesters have been holding rallies for weeks in the capital, Kiev, calling for the government to step down. The initially peaceful demonstrations have become angrier. Several people died in clashes with riot police in recent days. And the protests are spreading beyond Kiev, closer to Yanukovych's power base in the east of the country. I want to open this up to everybody. Um, these protests have spread now. It's not just a story in Kiev. Um, should Europe be more concerned than ever when it looks at what's happening in Ukraine? Well, I think there is a concern. The question is, what can the EU do? What instruments does the European Union have 
um, to have a positive influence on the situation. Um, and um, I think that at the moment there are other uh, suggestions on the table that maybe the uh, OSCE, Switzerland, could play a role mm -hmm. in, in mediating uh, in this conflict. While the EU, because it's sort of party of the conflict, um, should be very careful uh, what it does. Mm -hmm. So, and another question um, is, is this opposition really a sort of unified voice? Is it one camp? It, it looks like it's more and more split up, which probably uh, then would mm. play into the hands of the president, um, because if it makes the opposition, of course, mm. weak. Well, he's tried to do that, hasn't he? Because he's been offering prime, yes. the prime minister position, for example. He was offering that um, to the, the opposition. But so far, they haven't taken the bait. Yeah, that's true. Uh, I think opposition, for the past month, this opposition has been quite united. And they played, uh, they performed as one coherent team. Of course, after the crisis is resolved and they all have political ambitions, it will all unpack. But at the moment, I think it's too early to talk about that. So, so far, until the crisis is resolved, I think they are determined to go on as, as one team. And playing a, as a team. And Marion, what about you know, the role of, of NGOs? I mean, if something like Europe cannot help the situation in the Ukraine, um, NGOs, basically, they have nothing to say in this right now, do they? Well, NGOs always have something to say because they are representing the civil society. And in a healthy society, civil society are a vibrant part to push certain <clears throat> I'm sorry, uh, agenda points and here to also watch what is going on and to monitor and to liaise between parties could be a very important role for the non-governmental side to play. But I don't know how how actively this is um, also uh, done, I mean, in public, but I'm sure that uh, there are things going on where the civil society is a big part. What, and yeah, what about, the, what about the, sh the condition of civil society in Ukraine? I mean, mm -hmm. uh, it used to be very good until the laws were passed. Uh, we don't know um, how they're going to be implemented. But until that, surprisingly, because Yanukovych free, um, limited a lot of political freedoms, civil society was in a quite a good shape and was not really uh, touched. Uh, uh, and NGOs have played a very constructive role in the whole um, protest movement. They have organized whole logistics behind the stage and uh, they do a lot of in, um, translation of in, uh, materials uh, from Ukrainian into English, German, French, whatever. Uh, they uh, publish new newsletters. Um, <clears throat> there are NGOs which campaign for, <clears throat> for the EU to look into bank accounts and companies which are owned by Ukrainian businessmen who are close to authorities or authorities themselves. We know, for instance, that, uh, that um, Yanukovych's son has a bank account in Deutsche Bank, and uh, Azaro, who is prime minister, has a business in uh, Austria, and so on. So this is what and society the, demands. Exactly, and those are bank accounts that Europe, for example, could freeze if they wanted to, if they wanted to exert serious pressure on Ukraine, but that has not happened. Yes, uh, the first step one uh, Europe should make is to investigate the bank accounts. Mm -hmm. And then if you find uh, there are violations, there is an EU directive which instructs the banks to do that, uh, FAT regulations. So if they find violations, they should freeze accounts, yeah. Okay, let's talk a little bit uh, about the opposition, about these protesters mm -hmm. that we're, we're seeing on this, uh, the street. Um, I've had in our programs in the last couple of days, we've had several interviews with protesters. They, they had their masks on. Mm -hmm. They were um, occupying the Justice Ministry earlier this week. But what struck me in these interviews was actually how friendly and how nice these protesters were. It didn't fit what, what you were looking at. Um, how real is that? And you know, getting back with NGOs, are, are these protesters the products of coached civil society um, you know, organized resistance, if you will. Yes, absolutely. If you go to Maidan, uh, to, the state, uh, to the part which is occupied by protesters, you will be amazed how clean it is. Uh, the, the snow is cleaned very quickly. There is no alcohol. There is no uh, gar garbage. Uh, it's very friendly, very... So I think it's a huge capital we have experienced at Maidan, and it's very important to preserve it afterwards. And just, just a story, uh, the one of the houses near Maidan was occupied by police until 
uh, basically the day before tomorrow. And the protesters uh, won back this building and it was in a terrible condition with bottles from what kind, whatever, mm -hmm. left over there. A lot of garbage, they cleaned it within hours and it looks perfect now. So I think that's, that's very amazing. And, and you're describing too maybe a, an opposition, a protesting movement then that maybe has the stamina to last months, if they have to, maybe a year? Is, mm -hmm. is that the case? Yes, uh, many people are determined to stay, actually. Uh, so this, the campsite will be preserved. Uh, you can have more people in the streets on the weekends, of course, uh, but uh, people have a lot to lose from going back to the situation we had before. So they really are determined to change the country, not just to change the politicians, but to change the social contract between authorities and the society. And none of that change, I mean, do you think the opposition, any of these parties that are in the opposition, are they going to accept shared power with the president or does he have to resign? Uh, you, uh, you can accept the shared power as a president. Uh, elections are coming early next year. Of course, they will press for early elections. But what is the bottom line? There can be no shared power, uh, shared power in the government. So the deal which was proposed a, a bit earlier, prime minister and vice prime minister mm -hmm. position, with uh, positions like minister of economy, economy is in a very bad shape, um, or minister of interior who controls uh, law enforcement authorities. Uh, with those positions staying uh, um, within the presidential camps, the prime minister cannot really control the situation in the country. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it, it was a trick. It's a, it was a trick, yeah, and every, the people uh, called it a Trojan try try horse. A Trojan horse, yeah, yeah. exactly. Which, uh, which um, obviously someone like you know, Klitschko, he could see that it was a Trojan horse. Is Klitschko, is he the hero of Ukraine and its pro-European movement? Yeah. <laughs> I have a problem talking about heroes. I think uh, this is something you can probably say in hindsight, but it's always dangerous to make people a hero before you know you see any exit strategy and any positive outcome of something like that. Um, so what makes a hero a hero? I mean, in, in ancient times, it was people who fought very well. Yeah. Um, so far, I would agree what you said. I mean, if, if any of the opposition accepted this deal, it would probably look like they, they are losing their credibility. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, and, uh, but that doesn't make people a hero, but it's a wise movement not yeah. to, to step into a trap like that. Yeah, yeah. I would say yeah. that uh, every Ukrainian who comes to, to fight is a hero. And we have to bear in mind that uh, at least four people died, and these are young people who were not uh, they were just peacefully protesting, you know. Right. So these people are heroes and they should be remembered. Yeah. What about what we're seeing outside of, of Kiev? Uh, what about these protests in the eastern part of the country? Yeah. Um, what's, what's going on there? Well, people are equally unhappy about Yanukovych and his rule uh, everywhere, all over Ukraine. Just in the east of the country, you have um, a bit different um, economy, uh, structure of economy than in Western Ukraine. In Western Ukraine, you have mostly small and medium businesses. A lot of family members um, work abroad in Italy or Spain as guest workers, for instance. So people have more economic independence, and that leads to more political independence or independence for expression. Whereas in Eastern Ukraine, you have big enterprises, uh, plants which are controlled by oligarchs or people close to the president and there you are afraid to lose a job and of course you are afraid to speak up and to go out but nevertheless protests occurred uh, but they were brutally dispersed in some cities in um, Zaporizhia for instance but Dnipropetrovsk it was much worse even than in Kiev and the problem is that in Kiev when it is dispersed people go out in more numbers uh, there it seems to be calm people got scared maybe a lot of people are now in hospitals really dangerous, uh, injured seriously I mean, that, that, that's one aspect that we're seeing. Another are these right-wing extremists that we've seen suddenly appear on the scene. I think uh, this, uh, the role is exaggerated. Uh, I mean, uh, journalists uh, or who were at Maidan, if you go uh, to Maidan, um, behind the barricades, you see people who, are, who have businesses, who work for companies, who, are, uh, who have high education, and they prepare Molotov cocktails, you know. Because really, they're really angry with the authorities. So mm -hmm. it's not some right sector or some extremists, but uh, the whole protest movement has become more radicalized as a result of violence. 
because people who were killed, some of them were shot by snipers from the roofs. What is that? And nobody investigated what happened. And what does that, but what does that tell you? Does that tell you that something maybe is happening? Is that a homemade yes. threat? Uh, you, you, mm. you don't think it's coming from, from outside, from, right. from Russia, for there example? There are speculations. Um, we cannot prove that. There are a lot of speculations. You could see some TV footage showing uh, Russian tanks approaching Ukrainian border. It might be uh, somebody tries to create a panic but it might be true, we don't know really. Until we have some facts, uh, evidence, we cannot say anything. Uh, plus, we, we've talked about how, how relatively peaceful you know, th this movement um, has remained. And what about the foreign influence? Um, one of the big headlines this week has been the U.S. Vice President, Joseph Biden, calling the Ukrainian president. Um, is, is that something that even matters? Um, right now in this? Is it something that, that the world should be doing? Well, it's very hard to really know what is, <clears throat> what is going on and what influences what. I think it is very important to acknowledge, as it was uh, earlier here, that the opposition is not one opposition. So we have different opinions and we have to be very careful not to sideline as uh, the outside of the Ukraine with one um, party and then uh, favor uh, the probably uh, party which is not really having the ownership uh, when it comes to representing the people. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, it is a process we are in and one is really observing very carefully what is going on and what twists will uh, happen very soon and probably in a week time we will know so much more and we will also know so much more who would be the eligible person representing the ukrainian uh, society we're gonna to have to move on but you know when you were here back in december we talked about the possibility of the ukraine actually breaking apart um, mm -hmm. is is that something that you still think about i think it can happen if there is strong external force which um uh, inter interferes like Russia. Otherwise, I don't see why it would happen. So, if I, you know, asking you, do you think it's going to happen? You would say no. Okay, good. Hopefully not. Hopefully not. All right. So let's move on now to China. Its economy is slowing slightly. I'm sure you've heard the news, but it is still, of course, in the express lane. The rapid growth over the past decades has pumped up tension between the haves and the have-nots. China has a new super rich elite and they have been up to no good. That's the finding of a two year investigation based on leaked financial documents from the British Virgin Islands. Gross corruption at the top of communist China made possible by Western business. China has a new corruption scandal, but few inside the country are hearing about it. A U.S.-based group of investigative journalists says leaked documents show that relatives of top Chinese leaders, including President Xi Jinping and former Premier Wen Jiabao, are making use of offshore havens, like the British Virgin Islands, to stash their wealth. China's economic boom over the past decades has created a new class of millionaires. The new allegations suggest the communist elite has enriched itself and hidden the proceeds overseas. And just as officials claim to be taking action against widespread corruption in China, the government is prosecuting anti-graft campaigners. On Sunday, a court sentenced activist Xu Qiyang to four years in jail. His grassroots New Citizens movement has called for officials to publish their wealth in a move toward more transparency. Guj, let me ask you, is this a, a surprise, is this a story to just the West? I mean, is corruption anything new to the Chinese themselves? Maybe they don't know the details, but I think that it has been widely known that, um, you know, if you are the sister or the son or the brother-in-law of some high politician in China, you have a better chance to become a CEO and get these economic opportunities without a... Um, network of connections, you are nothing in China. And these people are very well connected. So the investigations uh, that were conducted by Western media, but they were certainly helped by some Chinese people, um, 
They reveal that, uh, for example, the family of Xi Jinping mm -hmm. uh, has amassed a lot of, of assets, but not Xi Jinping or his wife uh, as, as themselves. And the same is true for Wen Jiabao. In his case, the, even the wife uh, is very, very rich. Um, she was an expert for precious stones. Um, so this gave her a position where she could, you know, do all sorts of things. Not all of this uh, wealth is illegal, but it's probably in a gray zone. It's owed to the connections you have, the doors you can open, the influence you can um, guarantee over yeah. other I'm, people. I, I, I know. I, I was, that brings me to something I've been thinking about um, researching this story. What really is uh, corruption in China? Because uh, I'm, I'm sure that with a lot of business transactions, a lot of money goes under the table, and, and, and that's considered standard and acceptable. Yeah, there is all sorts of corruption, and some might be semi-legal and some totally illegal. Um, but if we look at the examples that have come out, for example, also that foreign companies they pay training courses. They invite, in order to get a contract, they invite people from this company to make a training course, which means a trip abroad, um, even to the extent that some people have uh, complained about training fatigue. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I mean, sorts, things like that, you, you can say this is illegal, it sort of smoothes the transaction. So there are all sorts of different forms, but it's clear that a lot of corruption is going on from the lowest level to the, to the highest level. What impact can, can the, these stories have then on corruption in, in China? I mean, if, if names of the highest political figures are being thrown out in the Western media, is there the possibility of any momentum being built that could even you know, put top politicians' careers in jeopardy? Well, there have been careers that have been very abruptly ended because the government itself or the new leadership itself, uh, about the first announcement they made when they came in power, Xi Jinping and Li Keqiang, was that they will start a big campaign against corruption. This is not the first time. Uh, Jiang Zemin, uh, the former president and party secretary in 2002 said that uh, fighting corruption is a matter of life and death for the party. The problem is that this campaign against corruption is conducted from within the party. It's an organ belonging to the Communist Party. So the problem is that there are no independent institutions, no control organs, no free media, no, no independent NGOs, right? judiciary. Yes, there are NGOs, but see what happened. I mean, mm -hmm. the, this one um, founder of this new citizen, citizenship movement or citizens movement got four years in jail. Mm -hmm. And in a way, it shows that the approach to reform of this new leadership is a top-down approach. It's not a bottom-up so, approach. But is, that, is that the message here? Um, if NGO members who were, who were just basically trying to get the truth out, if they're being punished for doing that, is the message from Beijing that uh, we want whistleblowers stopped? Or is the message um, we are serious about fighting corruption, but it's our job to fight it? Both, but they don't say we want to stop whistleblowers because uh, the leadership of this discipline and uh, control uh, organ within the party, they have established a website where whistleblowers can blow the whistle, but they have to use their real name. It's handled um, in China. In an, you have to China. give. So, yes. so there what, were some some. Are people uh, doing that? Similar websites by NGOs yeah. uh, that were a private initiative and they were taken down, but there is an official one, and um, this is to they say to prevent people from slandering or falsely accusing mm -hmm. uh, officials. And in the internet, it has been very common. And in these short messages, you post a picture, for example of an official with a golden Rolex. So now you see pictures of officials that go like this all the time. 
and don't want to display their wealth anymore. But now, if so I really, what, if what this uh, group wanted yeah. was that officials have to make public their assets, something they have to do anyway, but it's not made, made public. It's not known to the wider public. It's only Just to, the party. to the party. But what about the citizens, though? I mean, well, the citizens, they are, they are observing this. Like with their mobile phones, they can take But do they still have right? to give their name when they post well, the when picture? They, when they uh, use the official website, they do have to do that. Right. But they can also communicate these messages with the message services and in chat rooms uh, and within stay China. And stay anonymous, although there is now a new rule that they have to register with their uh, real name. Because what's the what, what's the risk in China if uh, if you you know tell the authorities that someone's doing something, in, in you know that's wrong? What's the risk of that coming back and biting you in the face? Well, I I don't know of any cases where this has come back, but probably you, these are not advertised or they don't come up in the media, but um, some of these cases have led to the end of the career of officials, mm -hmm. uh, like a video that was posted of one official um, who had sex with a, a young girl, um, and the, the video was posted. It, this was one of the mm -hmm. things that was used to smooth a contract, you know, to say uh -huh. we are, it was used for blackmail. Right. But somebody blew the whistle on that. So it's a very complex web, I think. And the question is, what is a sustainable approach if the leadership really wants to get rid of corruption? And there are some other dimensions in this uh, campaign we see now for a clean government against waste, against lavish banquets and stuff like that. Um, if you look at the people who have been accused on the highest level of corruption. Some of them are representatives of big state-owned enterprises, um, mainly oil companies, and they are usually from a network from the formal security chief. So this dimension of the fight against corruption could be a sign that the new leadership is still trying to um, establish its power and to get rid of political enemies. So, finding corruption means getting rid of your enemies in well, China. Well, that's one aspect. And there is a third aspect. If you take out the CEO of a state-owned company that have become very, very powerful, they are very powerful vested interests, let's assume this leadership is serious about reforming the economy, maybe even touching these powerful state-owned enterprises. Mm -hmm. If you take out the CEO, you give a strong signal to the second in line. If the next time we come and want something from you, right. you better comply. Yeah. So it's like trying to kill three birds with one stone. Yeah, I mean, maybe? it sounds like you know, a little, you know, a little bit from the book of North Korea in a way. If we don't like what you're doing, we'll send a strong message. We send a strong message, but the yeah, methods could be are. A bit, yes, it can be deadly yeah. because if you are convicted, I mean, there have been cases where these officials got the death sentence. Mm -hmm. So, if, for example, and for um, giving out licenses for drugs, I mean, this is a very powerful position if you can um, give licenses for, for business, right? And if it affects the health. That, well, they can get you in trouble. I, I, I'm still there. I want to pick up what can NGOs do in a, in a, a system like China right now? I mean, it, it seems, based on what we're hearing, that for NGOs, it, it's still this big, this big gray area, even a black zone. What do you do? Well, it is difficult. And what you have just explained, I think, is mainly about control and not losing control. And transparency and whatever NGOs stand for, uh, is probably a danger to the control factor a government here in China would like to hold on. So NGOs can, of course, always do a lot of lobby and advocacy work within the channels which are allowed 
talk to people, that is one thing, but then, of course, at the same time, make sure that they are working in the communes, in the communities, and to uh, get a good understanding of the power of people, because only mm -hmm. when you have the power of people together, you can really demand transparency on certain uh, decisions which are made by the public stakeholders. And that is, of course, a very fine line, and yeah. China always tried to open up, or opened up a little bit um, to the NGO sector, to the civil society, but then in the consequence to accepting uh, certain moves of the civil society, mm -hmm. they would shut down and get scared again. Before we move on... This has to do with Gojimba. experiences from other countries, we have like the color revolutions in the former That's true. Soviet Union. We have to move on, but a very... Quick question to you, um, Gudrun, with the economy in China slowing down, does that increase the risk of more corruption? I don't think that it increases um, or decreases it. Um, everybody in China or in the Chinese leadership would acknowledge that a certain slowdown of the economy is needed. They want to have a new growth model. Mm -hmm. They want to uh, be, be uh, growth to be based on consumption within China and not on the investment so in okay. infrastructure, so etc. So, I well, it's a concern because of unemployment and things right. like that, but not necessarily. I mean, the Gini coefficient, uh, the the inequality, inequality in China is already pretty big. Pretty big. People do not. Um, mind so much that other people get rich, but if they have the feeling that they are rich and don't deserve it and have not worked for it, then they get angry. And if they see, you know, the son okay. of some functionary uh, totaling to his Ferrari, yeah, then, exactly. then they get angry. Yeah, of course, as they probably should. All right. Now on to a story that should never be a story. Why are nations around the world failing to invest in the education of their children. The United Nations just released a report that gives terrible grades for the global effort to guarantee every child a good education. For girls, it's even worse. If nothing is done to improve access to good schools, it will be the year 2072 before all the world's poorest young girls can read and write. One of the Millennium Development Goals set in 2000 was primary education for all by 2015. UNESCO says that goal will not be met. Around the world, poor children are missing out on basic schooling. The UN organization's annual report on education has repeatedly highlighted the issue. Another worrying problem is the quality of education. Globally, there's a huge shortage of teachers. Many are themselves poorly trained. And despite much improvement, one of the greatest social problems remains the gender gap in education. Activist Malala Yousafzai highlighted the issue. The Pakistani girl received world attention for her insistence on getting an education even after a Taliban attack. But gender disparity in schooling persists. Why does it still persist? When we read these numbers from this report, I mean, you would think that it's the year 1700. Very true. I think it's a very, very sad story to hear that 57 million uh, children are actually struggling for access to primary education, out of which 32 million are girls. And if you look into that, it is such a multifaceted reason for it, and I think no reason is good enough as an explanation. For example, if you think that uh, girls are not safe in the school environment or on the way to school, which is holding them back to attend school, it's very sad. When we think of economic decisions households have to make, and one of the decisions would be not to send their girls to school or their children to school. Mm -hmm. This is also a very sad fact because even though a lot of governments say that schooling is free, there are a lot of hidden expenses. School fees are not there, but you have to still cater for um, books, textbooks, uh, uniforms, and uh, parents are um, asked for contributions, for example, if a roof is collapsing. You're right. So, and also we shall not forget that in some... Um, 
yeah, cultural settings, it's not much appreciated what a woman actually is doing for a family and for a community. Yeah, how, how much is that a factor? I mean, economic factors we know we can spot easily, but how can we spot cultural factors where it, it's simply not considered as important for a girl to get an education as a boy? That probably also gets back to education because people who know right. how important it is to have a well-educated or educated woman in a household, they know that the children, the whole family is healthier. They know that the woman has also a value in the market, in the employment market, and would be able to gain income. And they would also know that in the whole governing process of a country, it is very important to have female voices because they are able to understand certain circumstances, certain connections in society in a different way. And I would say much better uh, than sometimes men can. Yeah. And I mean, I mean also I just agree. look here. Yeah. I mean, we are three women and I'm I think it's not, <laughs> right. it's not very usual also in this format That's, and in this country to be Well, like I will agree with you. It is not every week that we have three women sitting at the table. That, that is true. Um, you know, you, to pick up on, on, on gender, what we've talked about with Ukraine and with China, almost everyone we're talking about in positions of power are men. It, that isn't that part of the problem, that as long as men are running governments, women and consequently girls are going to come up on the short end of education. I think in many households, women are the ones who are making the decision. But of course, they have to still convince the husbands, for example, how an economic decision is made and that a certain token should be reserved for schooling the girls. So I think we all also know how long behavior change is taking in any society. So if we would really get governments going on certain uh, yeah, valuing and accepting the importance of the role of women in a society and to cherish on that and to, to really bring this up front in the public, uh, that would definitely we help. We had that though, right? With, with Malala, for example, yes. who was shot by the Taliban. Um, do you think that's going to make a difference? It's not a sustainable thing to go on one very, very sad case. I mean, it is also shocking that it takes such a case to bring up education as such and education in certain countries to, to the public again. It should be an agenda point and it should be understood also by the international community that without having the basics right, no development goal will be reached mm -hmm. by far. And if we, for example, today have... St uh, still three countries where you have more than a million children n not attending primary school and you look where they are, you can't really say, oh, it's only in Africa or it's only in Asia. I mean, it's really widespread. It's spread, actually, I mean, it's all over the continent. I'm right? talking about is Nigeria with 5.5 million children, is Ethiopia with more than 1 million and Pakistan with 3 million. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's really a global problem and it's our responsibility to assist solving the problem, to assist the countries on their way. And we do have good examples. Give me, a, yeah, give me one example. I mean, we don't have a lot of time left. Oh, but what's an example, though, of, of a society of a country that has changed things for the better? For example, Rwanda. Rwanda was able, by political decisions, by government decisions, to really prioritize on education. And then they reformed also the process of how the money is channeled to uh, the institutions and together with the civil society they were able to raise for example the enrollment rates a, a lot and to have uh, so many also girls now at school that it is a very good example for the whole region where people are turning to from governments around mm -hmm. to learn lessons which is also key it, in learning lessons. Is education is it something that um, it sh is naturally a, an issue for women? When we talk about teachers, for example, we usually we're talking about women. Um, it's, is it, do women have a special responsibility to make sure that all kids get educated, especially little girls? 
I think women don't have or don't feel such a big responsibility as men in terms of sustaining the family. And that's why they are ready to accept low paid positions. And that's what we see in the schools. The teachers at the schools don't receive much money, whereas men would go into business or something else. Um, yeah. What are you saying, Gordon, about that? A special well, I'm, responsibility? I'm dealing, I'm dealing with a country where um, the ratio between boys and girls is 124 to 100. I mean, in China, more boys are born. And the reason is very simple, just like in India. Um, I, I don't think we have a... I don't know. Why do we have a special responsibility? Everybody has a responsibility to, to think about this and to try to, to change it. But you can probably expect more from women because they should be more aware of this. I'm not so sure that if more women are, you know, state leaders, this will change overnight. But um, I think it does make a difference if, if more women are in higher positions. I, I, Is well. that the case in, in Rwanda, for example, um, Marion? I mean, this improvement, did it, did it happen because there were, there were more women actors in government and NGOs? I can't say that from the data of the number of parliamentarians, for example. <clears throat> but, I mean, definitely the civil society played a role, and the civil society is definitely having more female representation than uh, other bodies. But, I mean, just back to your question, I mean, women are raising the children, and we are looking into the poorest countries, and they still bear the largest responsibility for it. So. To understand that, usually uh, women uh, do understand that case still better than men. We, we're running out of time. Let me just ask you that when you look at the UNESCO's report, um, obviously goals are not going to be met by 2015 or 2020. What's a realistic time frame to make sure all children have access to a decent education? Whatever time frame I would give is too late. So, for example, you mentioned... 2072. Yeah, but it's for, bo uh, for, for the poorest girls, right. it's only 86. Yeah, so okay. It, it's terrible, and we have to speed up the process. Well, let's wish all children luck on that. Thank you very much, ladies. Thank you very much for being on the show today. Keep the conversation going with us on Twitter and Facebook. Tell me what you think of the show today. You can find me on Facebook, and you can tweet me at Brent Goff TV, or you can use hashtag DW Agenda. And if you want to watch the show again, go to DW.de or watch us on YouTube. I'm Brent Goff in Berlin. Join me next time when I set the agenda.